So I'm using different methods to take my black type solution on my poster and to add color to the type. So what I have is one that I copied from, kind of cut out from a found texture, and then I played with a hard light blending mode. It's still at 100%. The problem is it's on top of my spot illustration because it's on top of everything. So I'm going to move that layer down. It's all about layer organization. Move it on top of my type. And if I turn it off, I have my green type underneath. But what's great about this, this is a rasterized cutout. It's still at hard light at 100%, but that doesn't mean I have to stick with the colors as they are. I can, for instance, make a duplicate of it so I can experiment and play with image adjustment hue saturation. You can always adjust levels, you can always adjust color balance, you can always adjust the hue. They're very eastery colors, right? They're very bright and saturated. And I can change the whole color spectrum of them this way. But I can also change their lightness and darkness, how colorful they are, right? So if I really just want subtle color, I think I want to go brighter. I can do this kind of thing with it play with the hue, play with the saturation, play with the lightness. It looks like uh, you have a pot outside for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Yes, sun bleached. If you move the pot, there's an empty space and you keep it and you slip it all. <laughs> yep. Like. Yeah, the, the drop shadow is a little strong. And that's what's nice about using layer styles is you can always turn off those individual effects or adjust them. So if I want to lessen that drop shadow, I just go to that drop shadow effect and I can just take its opacity down. Because a little of it's helpful, but not to the point where it looks dirty, right? So here we have a very Easter colored version of the type. And the type here is pretty clean compared to all the, the textures behind it. So if I want to dirty that up a little bit, I can take that type layer. I can duplicate it, right? And then I can turn it to dissolve mode and then take the opacity down. And you see it will break it up like a risograph print. It just takes the computer a little while to see it, right? I still have a very clean stroke outline on it that helps its readability. But if you squint, the text almost goes away completely. So here's another thing I could try. I can take that layer I just made, duplicate it, and then go up to image, adjustment, and invert it. So what was light is now dark. I can duplicate that and turn it off of dissolve and onto normal. And I get these inverted tones, so they're the opposite side of the color spectrum. And those show up a little bit better, and I kind of like those better. They're still the college colors, the blue and the green, but in a way that's a little bit, I don't know, more interesting. Okay, now, I mean, this is all perfectly good. This could be my final color for my type. And if that's true, then I'm just going to turn off everything else. all the background stuff so we can see what decisions you made on the type alone. What did I leave on? My offset. Right, and now I'm gonna save this as a PNG. So save a copy, save it as a PNG to assignment six or to your desktop. And this is gonna be my color type or my color text.
Now, it's not about making all of these decisions perfect. These are design decisions. It's about understanding the capability of how to control these things while keeping it as a vector so that you can always have perfect resolution at any size. Even when you're using rasterized color effects, they come from the vector, so they can always be scaled. Now that's the next thing, here it is, that I post to Canvas. You're required to have a blocking sketch, your black type, your color type, and then your finished poster. And your finished poster needs to have type, your spot illustration, or you could use your logo, a background of some sort, and a white border. So this is color type in Photoshop. Outputted from the smart. So by coloring your type in Photoshop, but doing it using the smart object of your EPS file, it's always going to be scalable. So it's perfect for doing color variations. Just like we, we used it for color variations on logos, you can use it on logo types, title flags, custom type design, and that's what's asked for in this poster. Okay, now I need to finish off the poster. I have a background, I have the type, I'm playing with different textures, so now I wanna sh share not just risograph kind of textures as a way of making it more in the world, more worldly, but also um, professional printing separates these millions of colors from the digital file into three colored inks and black ink, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And to do that, it uses a process called color separation. So I'm going to rebuild my layers here. And then I'm going to show you how we can play with color separation in Photoshop. I'm going to show you the really basic way first. And then we'll get into more advanced ways when we review for the final. And something I'm going to require that you know is something called half-tone half screen angles because that's very helpful in print jobs. All right, so here's my poster so far. Remember, I have this inspiration of this Decemberist poster, which just has a really simple, uh, this is a three ink poster. It uses a dark brown, actually uses a black ink that mixes with a magenta ink to give you this kind of dark brown. And then it has a cyan ink. And it's just those three inks on white paper. But the cyan has been broken up into half tones for these clouds. So it gives a variation of tones, kind of like duotone coloring, even though it's all just one color. So half toning is when you separate it into these mechanical dots. I have slides on it, which you can find under assignment sheets. With assignment six, it's an exhaustive explanation of CMYK color separation. And so we'll re review these when we're looking at the final exam as well. But basically, where you mostly see this is in old comic books and old Sunday comic strips. This was back when things were printed only on newsprint, which can only support 150 dots per inch. And so with the naked eye, you could see these dots make up everything. And if the dots make up everything, you can kind of see how they're just limited in their color. And artists now, even though they work digitally, like to reference the use of these CMYK colors. So cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And sometimes they'll leave the black out. This is what's called a CMYK black, which is just what you get when you overlap cyan, magenta, and black ink, or in yellow inks. It's kind of a muddy brown. Because inks are not perfect, like light is perfect. 
So there's lots of ways that you can separate out color. You can do it with what's called an index dither. That's what risograph does. That's kind of the random dissolve. But halftone is when you do it in this mechanical, what's called a half drop pattern, like bricks in a wall. And you can do that with different shapes, but most commonly it's done with ovals or circles to half drop. And so this image that you see here is just a combination of these four halftone screens layered on top of each other. If we zoom in on it, it looks like that. Now digital artists will use it as an additional technique on top of the color they already have as an effect. So let's say I wanted to add that effect to my spot illustration. Well, what's nice is I have the color of my spot illustration here. And I can take that, I'll duplicate it, and I'll rasterize it. Because I brought it in from a PNG. It was already rasterized, but it's a smart object. So if I turn off the line art on top, what I'm going to do is use a filter. And I'm going to use what's called the filter gallery. And this has a halftone option. It's under sketch and you'll see halftone pattern as an option. You want to do this on a duplicate because halftones only work in a single color, right? So it takes all of my millions of colors and it reduces it to one color, but it takes all my toning from my color and breaks them into halftone dots. And I can play with the size of the dots. I can play with how contrasted they are. I like them to be pretty bold and contrasted. And I can play with whether it's a dot or a circle. That's kind of a weird, it was used in 70s kind of psychedelic comics a lot, this kind of half toning. Or a line. And then in more professional pre-press, this is like a dot matrix printer. You can do it as like a check mark, as a star, all kinds of different things. So I'm going to use the dot that's traditional. And then I'm just going to say OK. Now on the duplicate, it's going to change it to this. That's obviously not what I want, right? But I did it as a duplicate so that then I can overlay it, right, with these different patterns. So I might use soft light. I might use pin light. Soft light works well. And it starts to blend in to my coloring, my duotone coloring. And it just gives it that little bit of vintage finish and panache. And if I don't want it to be so strong, I can take the opacity down. And I can also do that with my type. So let's take my color type. Let's take one of these really colorful layers, right? Make a duplicate of it. Go up to filter, filter gallery. And it will automatically do what I last chose. So you see those halftone dots. There they are. Then I'm going to set them to soft light and then take them above the color type that I'm using. And that helps to make that a little bit sharper, like it, make it feel a little bit more intentional. And before you print anything, you always want to look at it up close because this is what it's actually going to print. It's not always what you see on the screen. And I've built in a lot of this kind of random texture because I like that in my printed digital work. It looks more handmade that way. And I can continue to play with halftones. I could halftone the background. I could do all kinds of things. But even if it doesn't look good from far away, you'll see it you know, as you finish it. And so that's a good finished post.